And just a quick reminder, if you don't wanna be recorded, you can always turn off your video. Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. This is the first of five listening sessions and it's made possible through a collaboration with the Amherst Planning Department, Amherst Senior Services and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And of course, with this topic, uh, the Amherst Housing Trust. Um, so today we're going to talk about housing. As you all know, um, we'll be covering topics like transportation, social participation, um, public safety in upcoming sessions, um, all of which will happen on the fourth Monday of each month, running from May through September, uh, 2.30, and we'll end at about four o'clock today. Um, so just want to uh, also make a note that we're hoping to do the remaining sessions in person at the Bang Center, um, but if we do end up needing to change gears because of COVID, we'll update the Engage Amherst page on the town website. So thank you and take it away, Becky. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, um, so welcome everyone. Uh, as Haley said, this is the first listening session for Age and Dementia Friendly Amherst. Um, so today we're going to, uh, we've asked you to put your name in the chat and if you're affiliated with any organization or just a resident of Amherst, um, then I'm gonna do a quick poll. Um, and then a presentation, which will be a project overview with a focus on housing for older adults and aging in place, and a little bit on what's currently in place for older adults in Amherst, both, to, both in terms of housing for older adults and uh, what the zoning allows, and, and Nate's going to help me out there um, with this presentation. Um, and then we're going to, then we want to hear from you. So we're going to break into smaller groups um, and then hear back from everyone and have a larger discussion. And then we will present some of the results that we've gotten from the um, Age and Dementia Friendly Amherst survey around housing needs. Um, and then we'll have time for a little more discussion and talk about next steps. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and you will see a poll on your screen. Um, so here's the first poll question. Um, just click on your uh, age range. I'll leave it open for a couple minutes. Great. So. Here's the results. Can you all see that? <laughs> okay, so we have a good representation from all the age groups here, except for 90 plus. So that's great. Um, and then I will launch the next poll. Um, here's the next one. So you might want a minute to think about this. What kind of housing do you think is most needed in Amherst for older adults? And if you think if you think we've got plenty of housing in Amherst, then you don't have to answer. <laughs> That's not my problem. My problem is why do I have to pick one? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean. I could say something today and tomorrow I'd probably say something else. Yeah, that's fine. Well, that'll come out in our discussion groups. All I right. <laughs> okay. Another minute. And Okay, well, um, so here's what we have. So subsidized housing for older adults, mixed income, mixed age, rental units. Um, so quite a mix, but that's good. I mean, generally you want a mix of housing. So um, you're absolutely right, Alyssa. 
um, you may want to want more of a choice there. So, okay, and I'll go back to my slideshow. Okay, um, another, we asked people also in the registration report um, a few questions. And so this is some of the answers we got there. So 20 people who registered live in single family, nine condominium, four in subsidized apartments, and one in non-subsidized apartment. Um, five said they were hoping to downsize in the next five to 10 years and 15 said maybe. So that's quite a bit um, of the folks who signed up. And then are you or someone you know having difficulty finding support for aging in place? And 15 people said yes. Um, so that's, um, that's interesting. Um, so this project is part of um, an aging dementia friendly Pioneer Valley project that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, is doing through funding from the Tufts Health Plan Foundation, now known as Point 32 Health. Um, and we're helping a number of communities become aging dementia friendly through community engagement processes and developing community assessments and action plans. Um, the towns with the red hearts have already submitted reports um, for this work and the purple stars are uh, dementia friendly communities um, and the blue hearts are the communities that we have been working with on this project or are currently working with actually. Um, and so this forum is, on, is focused on housing um, for all of these um, all the communities we're working with, the community assessment um, is being organized around the domains of an age and dementia friendly community. So this model was developed through um, the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative and it's a combination of um, the eight domains of livability that the World Health Organization um, developed and 10, 10 sectors of a dementia friendly community. So it combines all of those into considering age and dementia friendly um, work in all of these sectors. Just some data from uh, the census and from the uh, Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative Community Profiles. Um, so the 2020 five-year five -year estimates um, say that 10.7% 10, 10 of the population of Amherst is over 60, that's up from 10.1% that was just a few years ago um, in the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative data. Um, I believe their data was from 2016, so that's about you know, four years, four or five years, it, it went up by a few percentages, or by about 0.6%. Um, up 8.3% from 7.3 to about, um, for people over 65, so about 3,300 people in Amherst are over 65. Um, and according to the census, 25.7% of people over 65 live alone. So that's down a little from what the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative was, um, and a little less than in Massachusetts um, overall, which is 30%. Um, there's a total of 94, about 9,500 households in Amherst. Um, about one third of those have one or more people 60 and older in each house in those households. And 30% of total households, uh, ho total householders live alone, 9% are 65 or older. Um, so about 853 households of um, 65 or older. Um, who, are living, who are living alone. And then um, some other data of interest, 13.4% 13 of people over 65 are veterans and about 11.7% um, have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or related dementias. Um, when we consider housing for an aging population, we want housing that's affordable. Um, so it could be smaller, shared units, accessory apartments, um, home sharing, um, you know, any of the housing types that I mentioned before in the poll. Um, accessibility is important. So first floor with a no-step entry um, or elevator access. And um, sometimes you might need wheelchair ramps to get into the house. Um, assisted living and long-term care options are, are important um, as people start to need more help and, and um, can't get help um, aging in place. 
um, smart growth. So housing that's located near to, close to retail services and parks um, and neighborhoods that are safe um, so people can walk or roll where they need to go and so that they feel safe walking in their neighborhoods. Um, some considerations for aging in place. Um, home modification may be needed for accessibility and to prevent falls. Um, assistance with basic maintenance and, and repair um, is often important as, as people find that they can do less. Um, assistance with other basic tasks such as yard work, shoveling, snow, grocery shopping, and transportation. Um, home care and home health care services when you start to need a little more help. Um, even with cooking, toileting, medications, um, and then transportation services or the ability to walk or roll to stores or services. Um, and as people need more help, um, possibly um, rides, individual rides where people actually help, help to get through the door of where you wanna go. Um, when we talk about people living with dementia, um, there's more mobility, visual and hearing limitations um, uh, exacerbated by sensory loss. Um, so again, you wanna make sure that there's um, barrier-free design, so no step entrances, um, different counter heights, first floor residences, making sure that there's no trip hazards in the house. Um, and even up to automatic timing on burners, um, you know, for, for stoves, if, if people tend to leave the stove on, clearing boundaries between the rooms, um, and including architectural variety, because sometimes, you know, there's developments that all, you know, all the units look the same. It can be confusing with some, for someone with dementia. Um, and in order to do this, the town might want to consider um, building in incentives for um, homes that meet accessibility standards. Um, some of some housing assessment data um, from the, the census, um, the detached single family units in Amherst account for about 50% of the housing stock and 50% is multifamily. Um, there's a little bit more renter occupied housing than owner occupied. Um, and it, as of December 2020, 12.6% of the housing is subsidi subsidized um, or meets the standards of the subsidized housing inventory by the state. Um, the state requires that all communities have at least 10% subsidized housing, um, or if they don't, that means that um, developers can come in and um, with a little less um, control on the part of the town, but, but Amherst has enough housing stock now um, in terms of, of the subsidized housing inventory. Um, some examples of, of housing authority properties that are mainly for older adults, um, Ann Whalen Apartments has 81 bedroom apartments, four of which are wheelchair accessible. Um, this is located near the Bang Center and it has a community room and greenhouse. Uh, Chestnut Court at 33 Kellogg Ave um, has 31 bed bedroom apartments, and that's about a mile from the town center. Um, these are also on the first, first floor. They're not specifically for seniors, um, but uh, the first floor um, is, is a draw for older adults. Um, and then the John Jean Elder House has three apartments um, for elderly or disabled and three others are, are rented out to social service agencies. Um, unfortunately, the waiting list for housing authority properties is very long. Um, this is from the housing authority, some numbers they gave me. Um, currently there's 13,000 people on the waiting list for um, Amherst Housing Authority properties. Um, I should say this is a statewide waiting list, so it's not, it's probably not all Amherst residents waiting because um, people can choose their first, second, and third choices. So this is probably, this, this list is from a statewide um, application. Um, so about 2,700 are interested in elderly or handicapped housing. Um, it's a lot. So that's a very long, long wait um, and just sort of emphasizes the need for more affordable housing in town. Uh, in terms of independent assisted and long-term care communities, Applewood at Amherst um, run by the Loomis communities is an independent living community. 
Um, Green Leaves has market rate independent living uh, for older adults, uh, both ownership and rental units. Um, the Arbors is an assisted living community. Um, and then there's the Center for Extended Care and Rehabilitation, um, which is a nursing home and has a dementia care unit. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Nate to talk a little bit about what the zoning allows in Amherst. Sure. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town. Um, I help with some housing projects. You know, so I think there is a few, um, you know, zoning is a really powerful land use regulation tool that towns and Massachusetts municipalities can use. Um, so Amherst does um, allow different types of housing. Um, you know, we have a broad range, you know, anywhere from apartments to mixed use buildings, which can be multiple units, um, often they're rental units in the town centers to single family homes and some other types of development in the outlying residential areas. Um, you know, the, the issue there is zoning can tell you what to build, but the market in terms of demand um, brings, you know, there, that force with it. So right now we see a lot of development, uh, rental development for students or um, young professionals and not necessarily for other populations. And so, you know, even uh, development for single family homes for starter families, for instance, uh, is not something that the market is, is trending towards right now. So uh, we allow, you know, varying types of development in town. It's just, um, you know, we'd have to find ways to incentivize it if we see, you know, if it becomes a priority, if we see it as a priority. Uh, we do allow accessory dwelling units, ADUs. It's something that uh, the town worked to change the bylaw last year. And so, you know, those can be um, completely enclosed within a house. It can be a whole separate apartment. It can be, you know, you can convert a garage. You could build a new dwelling unit. Um, on the property. And so these are intended to be smaller units. One, one of the units, the accessory dwelling unit or the single family home would have to be occupied by the owner uh, and one could be rented, but it is something that, um, you know, we really worked on to make this process easier to get these accessory dwelling units permitted throughout town. So they are allowed um, in quite a few zoning districts in around town. Uh, John Hornick is on this um, meeting. He's the chair of the housing trust. So the Amherst Housing Trust has been around for a number of years now. And uh, we're working to build a portfolio of projects and you know, uh, facilitate projects looking at town-owned land and private land. And so um, you know, there are some opportunities in the near future to um, see if there is a chance for you know, housing that the market isn't building, right? So if we're not providing housing for um, 55 and older or for, you know, smaller uh, homes for families or, you know, just affordable rentals. That's something the housing trust can, can work toward. Um, there are grant programs, um, as we see on the slide, uh, PVPC, you know, Becky works for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and Community Action offer grants. Um, the, the town, sometimes if we do require, acquire certain grant funding, we can participate in programs that allow it, um, home modifications. Um, we can always help pe put people in touch with programs. So, you know, although we may not offer it, we can be a resource um, in town hall. Uh, and then there's Amherst Neighbors. So there are, um, you know, nonprofits or just, you know, coalitions in town or groups that can help people also find resources and put them in touch with services or people. So Amherst Neighbors is not affiliated with the town of Amherst, but they're a growing and great resource for people. Um, they have an online presence uh, and a website. So that's, you know, we try to have different mechanisms for people to reach out if they need assistance. And I will say that the town is, you know, if people have questions, you can always call the planning department and we're willing to take down your name and number and also do some research for you and get back to you if you have any questions. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, and Amherst Neighbors, um, I put down there is really a resource to help people aging in place because um, they can help, um, some of the volunteers can help with basic tasks. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to volunteer um, for this organization um, for anyone who's looking to, to help people out who are, who are aging in place. Um, I should say also the Community Action Pioneer Valley has a grant loan, home modification grant program. Um, and I don't have information right here, but um, definitely look on the Community Action Pioneer Valley or um, Pathfinder websites. Um, they, they, they do provide grants for home modification. So 
Um, at this point, we are going to go into breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. Um, so let's see, we have 24 people. So I think we could do four breakout rooms. Um, yeah, so Haley, Maureen, John, and Nate, I will um, break people into rooms. Uh, so let me just delete this one. Yeah. And so you'll see, um, let's see, this is just going to take me a minute. Does anyone have any questions right off while I'm moving people into rooms? <laughs> Feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Okay. How much time for the breakout rooms, Becky? Um, so the breakout rooms will be uh, 20 minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll come out at about 3.15. Becky, are there specific questions you want us to address? Yeah, so the facilitators will go around um, and ask each of you to um, list an asset and a challenge in, in terms of housing for older, older people in Amherst. Um, and then you'll, in the last five minutes, you'll talk about um, what you think are the, are the biggest priorities. Okay. Sorry, this is just going to take me a little bit. <laughs> okay. So you should see, um, Okay. Hi, Claudia. Oh, there you go. Norma, did you see a room come up? You should be able to, um, you should see something that says join room and then you can click on it. Oh, you're muted. Um, Terry, okay, Phyllis, do you see um, a room come up on your screen? And Terry, you should, you should see a button saying join room on the screen. And if not, you can unmute and I can try to help you. There you go. Terry, do you see a room come up? There we go. John, you, we, you froze for a minute there. You might want to just repeat your last couple of points. I, I think what I said was that uh, our two biggest issues is the lack of places for people to move, good options to move. If they do want to move out of their single family house, homes or wherever else they are, and the problem of affordability, affordability in remaining where they are, and affordability in finding a place to move. So I think that summarizes a lot of the discussion we had without getting back into the detail. Great. Thank you. 
And Nate, I think that was the last group. Sure, thanks. You know, John, John's challenge is really, you know, we, we have the same top two, affordability and then limited choice. And I think the nuance with availability, availability of housing is not just, um, you know, one type of housing, but also having like a graduated facility. So you could have independent living to, um, you know, assisted living to full-time care within one, um, you know, one institution, right? So right now it may be that you have to move out of Amherst, it could be an hour away, it could be further away to find a place and then um, you know, that becomes a challenge. And then, as John mentioned, the affordability, both of staying in town or then finding a place, right? So to move into a place that has um, care is really expensive. And so, you know, it, it may be that it, it really does, it becomes a really big financial burden. Um, you, know, you know, although that being said, a lot of people said that the, you know, they moved to Amherst because, you know, to, to kind of equally weighted Assets were the the area in terms of both um, cultural and you know and cultural amenities and institutions, right? So there's lifetime learning, there's events, there's things to do. It's an active small town, so it's not it's not too crowded like a city, but it offers great amenities. Um, it's also the surrounding area, right? So it's close to nature. There's outdoor parks, state parks, and that was seen as an asset. Um, that being said, there is some you know limited options for accessible trails, or if you really do need more accessible amenities, those are difficult to find. Um, even the sidewalks are in difficult condition. So, you know, kind of overall picture, you know, like John said, housing availability and price, um, but then there are a lot of assets, right? Um, uh, both from the, you know, kind of cultural and support to just, you know, being able to do things. I will say, Haley, you did mention public transportation, but our group mentioned that that's also, they, we actually mm -hmm. saw it as a challenge. Um, there really isn't enough bus service um, in terms of you know, dedicated bus routes and stops. And so it is difficult to get around without a vehicle in town. Um, and so, you know, although there is kind of a reduced fare public transportation, it, it is limited in service and scope. So it's something that was mentioned as, you know, could be improved, but... Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so that's a good segue. There will be a, a forum on transportation coming up this summer and we hope to have it in person. So we hope everyone will be able to come to that as well. Um, so I'm just gonna move on um, and we're gonna present um, some of what the survey uh, showed. We, we had a, a really good response to the survey. Um, I'll just share my screen. We had 875 responses, which is amazing. Um, so, and 80, about, almost 85% are 60 or older. So that represents about 17.3% um, of the over 60 population in Amherst. So that's a really good good turnout for the survey. Um, most people had lived in Amherst for more than 15 years. So almost 77% um, of people who responded to the survey have lived in Amherst quite a while. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, um, the Housing Trust and the Senior Center um, did a really good job and, and engaged Amherst of um, really trying to engage all sectors of the population and get a good representation of, from people of color. Um, so the race, ethnicity of people over 65, 91.9% um, .9 white. Um, so in fact, we got a little more um, representation from people of color um, in the survey. So 4.2% Black or African-American, 2.7% Hispanic, Latinx, 2.8% uh, Asian, um, and 0.9% American Indian or Pacific Islanders. So that was really good representation. Um, in terms of uh, people, who people live with, 28% um, of survey respondents said they lived alone. Uh, almost 63% lived with a spouse or partner. Um, and then a number with adult children or other children or family members. Um, some said they lived in a nursing home. Um, one person, or at least one person said a shelter. 
and several people, but they lived with their cats and dogs. And that's, a, that's an important consideration because they know a lot of um, people want to keep their pets when they move out. So it's important for, for new places to allow pets. Um, so some of the main focus areas, we asked people, you know, what were the top three focus areas that the town should focus on in the next five years to make the town a better place for people as they age. Um, and most uh, picked housing as their first choice, 29%. 20% 20 20 said housing was the second highest priority. Um, health and community services came in second. So that also plays into you know, services that are needed for people who are aging in place. And even a lot of places that do provide assisted living, um, you know, sometimes you need more services than those, those facilities will provide. Um, so having available um, health services or people like Amherst Neighbors is a really great resource for people to help um, with community services to help people age in place. Um, and then 15% said transportation was the highest priority. So those were the top three. And we see that in a lot of communities. Um, so most people said that they want to stay in Amherst as they get older. So almost 71% said it was either extremely important or very important to be able to remain in Amherst. Um, so that's, that's a big one. Um, we also asked if people, if there are times when people don't feel safe. And so almost 18% said they don't feel safe at times in community. Um, I just picked out the 71 responses to that question. Um, I picked a few out related to um, housing, um, but there were a lot of comments about sidewalks and being able to walk on the street. Um, he said one person said they live in a shelter. So that that's, you know, a lot of stress. And especially for older people, there just aren't the supports available in, in most shelters if you don't have a home. Um, someone said they don't want they wouldn't want to be a cogn cognitively confused person on the streets on a student party night. And that gets to um, the idea of a dementia friendly community, which is really educating all sectors of the community, including student population, you know, how to how to recognize people with dementia um, and how to, you know, just be kind and supportive of people. Um, someone said that they their home was broken into. Um, someone said they fear police stops and traffic stops and and you know, unfortunately, that's probably a person of color. I didn't look at that survey. Um, but some people are, are afraid of, of police. Um, and then one person said, I think to stay in Amherst, I'll neither need to use all my retirement on housing or be homeless. Um, and it's a frightening, it's a really frightening situation for people. Um, so we asked if people do want to stay in their homes and most said it's either extremely important or very important. So 83%. Um, and again, as someone mentioned early on, you know, you might change. It might, you know, you might need more supports where you can't stay in your home anymore. And that's where it gets to the point of, you know, you might have to move. Um, so this chart is, it's a little complicated, but it's, um, so this was comparing where people now live now to preferred residents in five years. Um, so currently, uh, 578 people said they lived in single family homes. Um, in five years, only 314 said they wanted to live in a single family home. Um, so again, the, you know, a lot of different options here, apartments or condos, senior independent living facilities, assisted living, um, group home or co-housing. Uh, subsidized housing, and a lot of people said a location close to services. Um, so John's going to talk a little bit about more about these numbers in the next slide. So I'll turn it over to you, John. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to focus on a piece of what Becky just reported. Um, and what I want to focus on are people living in a single family home. As Becky said, a high proportion of people in our survey are currently living in a single family home and a pretty high proportion, close to 50%, expect to move elsewhere in five years. 
Um, where do they expect to move? Again, that was uh, touched on by Becky. The most popular answer is senior independent living. Um, people also said apartment building. There's probably a lot of overlap between those two categories. Uh, third important categories is assisted living and other people spoke about hoping for an accessory or in-law unit. And again, as Becky mentioned, and again, this is gonna overlap is many people want a location that's accessible to stores, et cetera. So a lot of people who live in single family homes now see themselves moving to live with or closer uh, to others than they might be in a single family house. Now, what are the implications of this? Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, I made took uh, an initial stab at generalizing from the survey re results to population needs. I will tell you, I need to do some more work on this, but at least this is a rough idea about where we are and it's pretty significant. Um, there are over 6,000 adults over the age of 55 on the Amherst street list as of November, 2021. If we try to generalize from the survey results, um, or well, from the street list, about 63% live in single family homes, which is consistent with what we had from the survey data. Again, generalizing, if we assume about 50% of those, that is the ones who currently living in a single family home, expect to move in the next five years, what does that mean for new housing in Amherst? It means that we'd need about 2000 new housing units for older adults. That's a huge number for a town of this size. Um, Amherst has currently less than 10,000 housing units in total. So if we were to try to add 2,000 new housing units for older adults, that would be a huge change. Um, it may well be an overestimate, and like I said, I'll do some work to try to refine it, but even if we conservatively reduce it by half, that still would leave, leave us with a projected need of a thousand new units. And it's not clear where we would get those if you see all of those people moving out of their single family homes. Okay, going on to the next slide. Uh, what are the barriers uh, to people remaining where there are? The, the biggest one is affordability. It appears by itself on this slide. And then it appears again on the next slide basically 84% or about 15% say their housing is not afford affordable. So that's the biggest barrier to staying where you are. Um, other barriers here listed from top to bottom include concerns about paying for home repairs, concerns about paying for home modifications uh, to make it more age friendly or disability friendly concerns about paying for basic home maintenance. All of these things are things that would force people potentially out of their current homes. Those are things that I listed as major challenges. Um, then we have another slide with minor challenges. And this time the biggest category is at the bottom, uh, needing help with basic tasks or errands, uh, is the largest category. Next is going upward. Do not have a friend or neighbor or relative within 10 minutes who could give you assistance with a minor task or an errand. Um, issues with uh, finding various services, including yard work or snow shoveling. Uh, financing comes up, bill paying assistance, fuel assistance, and just getting housing application assistance for a very small number of people. But the biggest stuff is basic tasks or errands and the senior center and Amherst neighbors are both um, trying to position themselves to address those kinds of needs. I should have said earlier, 
but I'll just mention it now that um, I relied on Nicole Orient, who is uh, an intern with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do this analysis. And I am appreciative of the work that Nicole did. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Nicole's right next to you on my screen here. So. Um, Nicole has done a huge amount of work on this project and for the other communities we're working with and um, has done a lot of the graphics as well as the survey analysis. So we really appreciate all Nicole's help. Um, so at this point, we have um, about 15 minutes for, uh, let's see, oh, we have, we have longer. So we have time for more discussion. So um, anything, any, any initial reaction that folks have to the survey results or, or the discussions you had in your, in your breakout rooms? Uh, Dorothy, and you have to unmute. <laughs> I thought of another asset, which makes this even more important. Uh, we had originally retired to Norfolk, Connecticut, an absolutely beautiful place in Northwest Connecticut. But if you want to go to a doctor, that will take most of your day, just driving back and forth. After I found out, moved to Amherst, I realized I can't leave this town, even if I wanted to, because I, I have just on university drive, I can go to four or five or six different medical needs. Just it's so convenient here. I, I think it's probably more convenient in Amherst than in many other towns. And that's a big, big plus because we could find our week with the eye doctor, the skin doctor, then your GP, and then getting your shot. You can spend a lot of time doing medical things when you're a healthy adult in order to stay healthy. So I just think that we that Amherst is really a good town to grow old in and we don't have the housing as John just was pointing out with the, we don't have it and we, and we need it at particularly at affordable levels. That's it. Lisa. Yeah, related to the affordability thing, I understand the points John was making about people who live in houses that they can no longer afford or can't afford to maintain. But I think, I know I would not be able to find any place that would cost me less than where I live now. And even for people in single family houses who feel they can't afford to maintain them would probably find pretty much the same thing that, that they can't, you know, can't afford to, to move either. Given the oh given the shortage of housing, et cetera. So overall affordability and availability. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else? Dorothy, your hand's still up, but I assume you're all done. Christine, Chris. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention the fact that um, most housing in Amherst is built by the private sector. And, um, you know, they're looking for a return on their investment. And so they tend to build um, apartments that are kind of expensive and they build large single family houses. So if we are serious about, you know, providing housing, providing more housing that's affordable, we're going to have to think of some other mechanism and a few mechanisms have been used. Um, we've got one thing going on that John is very familiar with, which is the new housing on Belcher Town Road and the East Street School. So the town, you know, purchased the Belcher Town Road property and they owned the East Street School property and they were able to uh, put out an RFP to attract developers to build um, mixed income housing there, predominantly affordable. But the town had to invest in the property um, on Belcher Town Road in order to make that happen. Um, the town also um, encouraged um, Valley CDC to consider building a ho housing for very low income people. And that's currently under construction on Northampton Road, but that took a long time to get it going. I think it was from um, the first time we had a housing forum, which was 2016. And now, um, you know, that project is finally um, starting to be constructed. So that took, you know, about six years to get it really going. So these things, I guess what I'm getting to is it takes time. 
and it takes you know public um, investment, public willing to put in money to make these things happen, and it also takes effort to work with um, private developers who are willing to build, build affordable housing, and and they're kind of um, scarce. So it's going to take um, it's going to take a big community effort to make this happen. Just wanted to mention those things. Thank you. Ricky. Ricky, I see your hand oh. up. <laughs> I'm new to Zoom, so I don't know how to use the chat. How do you, when we're asked to say our name and if we're, you know, representing a group or anything, how do you do the chat? To, I typed little, it in, but I didn't know what to do after that. Do oh, I just you close can hit it? Return. You can't uh, return? Yeah. If you see the little talk bubble, do you see the chat window? No, I'm off of it. Okay, I, okay. And I just hit return and that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the other thing was that, um, future, that it was mentioned that future meetings might be held in public mm -hmm. for the public. I was wondering if it could also be held on Zoom for those of us who can't get to the meeting. We talked about that. Um, it's yeah. We we can look into it. It's it's going to be difficult to get you know have people participate in person and on Zoom, but um, we can certainly look into it. What do you think, Maureen? <laughs> uh, so we um, we have reached out to Amherst Media, and they will be recording uh, the in person listening sessions. So. Uh, while they the recording won't be live, uh, it will be recorded and then uh, broadcast on their channel, their cable channel, and then on their website um, a few days later. And um, we can certainly, we'll certainly um, post those videos um, on the project page on on Engage Amherst. Um, and so that that is an, uh, a one way that you can you can uh, participate or, or view the the meetings. So we hope you find that helpful. Yeah, and stay tuned because we're still you know we're hoping to meet in person. Um, you know we'll we'll continue to discuss to see how it goes. If if it turns out more people are able to participate on Zoom, you know maybe we do that for one of another future meeting. Um, the, I will say the fifth meeting, we're hoping to um, be all in Spanish and, and that will cover all the topics. So uh, Maureen and Haley are working hard on finding someone to help facilitate um, the Spanish speaking meeting. Uh, Linda. Oh, you're muted. I am an experienced Zoom muter, so I forgot to unmute, sorry. The, um, in response to the issue that was just raised, uh, the technology exists to have meetings be bimodal and run properly. And it, the, the clock is not going to wind back from the pandemic on that. Having to work from home just got the whole country to the point where they understand the upsides of that as well as the downsides. I, Amherst cannot afford to get left behind. It's a very modest investment to get meeting rooms a quick with adequate sound pickup so that the people who are remote can hear to get one big screen in the front so that the people in the room can actually see at manageable size, the people that are online, that should be a high priority. You know, we're talking a few thousand dollars to get at least one room set up that way. And then every meeting room gradually should be set up that way. It's just not acceptable to not be able to handle remote as well as in-person uh, participation and call yourself participatory. And particularly if we're talking about issues that affect uh, older people who don't necessarily feel comfortable going out at night anymore, for example, whereas the younger people had day jobs and <laughs> meetings have to be at night. You have to be prepared to support both. Um, the, but what I really put my hand up for before was just um, in responding to um, the the three projects um, that Chris you reported as in progress and having taken a lot of time have in common that the town invested in the land or was left the land and or already had the land from another purpose and 
um, speaking from my experience in the land trust as an approach to affordability, whether the land is held in trust by a, a private or communal venture, or whether it belongs to the town, the absolute key feature to having things be affordable and still have developers be able to make a living on the contribution they make um, is for there to be communal ownership of the land, either by the town or by a nonprofit or by the, the in a big enough development, it can be held in common by the people in the development themselves. That's a great point. Yeah, that's another model that, that we should definitely include in there. Um, and in terms of a, a hybrid meeting, I will say we, we have been, <laughs> we discussed it. Um, there is that capability in the select board chamber. Um, it just, there wouldn't be room there for breakout rooms and, and that kind of thing. So we'll keep talking about it and hopefully we can come up with a solution that, that works well for everyone. But I appreciate the fact that, that all of you do participate on Zoom and that if, if that is easier for some people, then we'll definitely you know, take that it, into consideration. The, the breakout... The breakout problem is, is easily solved in one aspect, not so easily in another. If you break people up by topic, so everybody who wants to talk about X goes to one room and everybody who wants to talk about Y goes to another, that's trickier to manage if you're doing a bimodal meeting. But if you're breaking people up randomly, you just create some Zoom breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. you know, so the people who are in person go you know, divide up however you want to divide them up and you create a couple of Zoom breakout rooms. That's easy to solve. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Patricia. Okay, I have, I have two questions. Um, first of all, how does Amherst's planning, particularly around housing, how does it interact with um, the planning in other towns? If there's going to be a future need for a thousand new units, is uh, Sunderland going to build a thousand new units plus some for Sunderland residents? Is there any kind of regional thinking about this? I, I assume that there is. And second, <clears throat> um, several people, someone in our breakout group and some other people um, have brought up the question of downtown businesses and how practical they really are. For example, if you need groceries or hardware or shoes or something like that. Um, one solution to that that I've known about a little bit in, in low income neighborhoods is actually to subsidize those kinds of businesses because um, grocery stores, for example, need a certain, um, um, they, they measure the size of the constituency when they determine whether it's profitable to build a store. And sometimes it isn't profitable to them to build it where you want it. So a subsidy is sometimes the only um, solution. Is that something that's possible for the business community or the town? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Um. Chris, do you want to just, uh, Chris or Nate, do you want to talk about regional or um, is Nate still here? There? No. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think, you know, um, Pioneer Valley Planning has been uh, sponsoring regional housing meetings and there is a regional housing plan. Um, that being said, a lot of the implementation comes down to, you know, town by town, municipality to municipality. So, um, you know, I think John and the Housing Trust has also done a good job of trying to have some more regional conversations. I think it could be strengthened. Um, so, you know, I really do think, um, I think there's, I think that's a challenge actually is, you know, housing is a regional need, but it often comes down to each municipality and how it's zoned or how it's permitted or how, you know, what kind of support or subsidy there is for it. And so I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, we often say whether it's for student housing or for other types of housing, you know, Amherst can't really build its way out of it if it's, you know, if other towns are not also uh, increasing housing supply, just, you know, the demand is so great in the area. Um, so I think that is a good point. Um, you know, it's something to consider too. You know, I think maybe that's a takeaway as well from, you know, from here, from this process as, you know, another point of regional collaboration. Thanks. Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about too. There's, there's statewide studies on housing, you know, supported housing, but as a region, um, I think it does make sense to kind of look at, at it regionally because a lot of, you know, a lot of the smaller towns don't have the infrastructure to build 
you know, multiple multi-unit housing. Um, right. So yeah, Wayfinder is out of Springfield. They're yeah. a nonprofit developer and they do other things. Uh, partnered with the Donahue Institute at UMass, and they published two studies in the last year about housing in the in the um, Pioneer Valley, looking at countywide information. Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin County. They didn't go too detailed into town um, specifics or demographics, but it is interesting that they, you know, use that as you know a county as the study, uh, you know, geographic extent. But you know, then it's you know there was a meeting about how do you implement it, and it's really then you know like I said, town by town. So studies can show that there's a regional need, and then it's really difficult to coordinate kind of a an approach, a, a, re, a regional approach to that. John. Hope you're muted. John, you're muted. Oh, I got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, Keith Ferry, who's the president and CEO of Wayfinders, is trying to convene a regional group to address the issues that were identified in the uh, study that Nate uh, identified. And we'll see where it goes. We've had one meeting and they'll be trying to schedule another one. But as Nate noted, the biggest barrier is the fact that these decisions are really made town by town. And I'll use that to segue into another point I want to make. At least half the people on this call are aware of the fact that um, the town has now purchased Hickory Ridge. And while there are a variety of very important purposes for which the town made that purchase, there is a small part of that property that is probably buildable on West Pomeroy Lane. And as I have suggested on a number of public and private occasions, I would like to see um, that buildable area go for housing. It may be exclusively housing for people who are older, older adults, or it could be mixed housing. But if we can squeeze out five to nine buildable acres there, um, we could do a nice job of adding to the units that we need in town. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Dorothy, we have a couple, another minute. So this question has to, is, is, is kind of technical. Oh. Dorothy froze for a second. Um, Linda, do you want to ask? I, I, it's just I, a quick. A, oh, oh, sorry, Dorothy. Dorothy's back. Okay, Dorothy, you're frozen. So oh, say I'm that sorry. Again. Okay, so it's it's a, the the lack of of um, housing, senior housing for moderate income people, people who make the AMI. For example, I was saying Sunderland just built some affordable senior housing and we're building some affordable housing, which is not senior housing, but is housing for whatever. Um, is there a problem in terms of getting grants and funding or even using town land if you're building senior housing, which would include, um, which would be available to seniors of moderate average middle-class income because people want to buy, build stuff for the high end that's very expensive, but that's, I don't think, where the, the big need is. Um, so this is a, a question for, for John, really. John, you're muted. Uh, Nate can answer it as well. Um, it depends on the source of funding, but yes, um, we can include housing for modest people um, that's actually included in the Belchertown Road, uh, East Street school site. Um, we will have a small number of units that are available for people with 200%, oh, sorry, 100% of area median income, um, which gets to a moderate level or modest level of income. It's not all for a low income. And those units could go to older adults, um, but as far as I know, we have no mechanism for setting aside units for older adults. Sure, yeah, I think to John's point, typically a developer will create a 55 and older development because you can, you know, if it's categorized as that, then there's certain subsidies or restrictions you can have in place. But if it's a, just a general affordable development, 
oftentimes, you know, it's, um, it's more difficult to then have, you know, a set aside a certain percentage of units for a certain age group or something. So, you know, some of it, it might be that at conception of a project, it needs to be um, that, you know, some, uh, so many units should be set aside for say 55 plus, whether it's home ownership or rental. Um, I, there, believe it or not, I think, you know, developers specialize in that. So, um, you know, we, we, like I said, we, in our breakout group, we did reach out to some, and it's really interesting. It's become, you know, everything's so specialized now in terms of what you do, but a developer who really wants to do senior living does it, and it might be different than someone who does just general affordable um, housing. So I think it's something that, you know, that we could, like John mentioned on Hickory Ridge, if that's a, what we want, we put it in there as a parameter and we see what kind of interest we get. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Linda, and it is four o'clock. I wanna um, respect people's time if anyone asks to leave, but um, I'm also, we, I think we're open to staying a few more minutes. This, Linda. Is, uh, this is by way of a response to the point that I think Patricia made about um, subsidizing businesses. There's a business model for groceries particularly um, that I've encountered in a couple of places in England when I was there on sabbatical. In Oxford particularly, which is very similar to Amherst in terms of the demographic, the age demographic of the population that it serves and also a very desirable location to live. Um, and, and much of it is walkable. Um, the big supermarket chain, which has an enormous um, center that you have to take your car and drive to the very edge of Oxford to get to, has a location in central Oxford that you can walk to from everywhere in central Oxford. And the square footage is tiny. There are a lot of shops in Amherst that have similar square footage and um, they run most of their inventory through it. They must have a little bus that goes back and forth between that and the main section. So you can walk into the downtown chain, Sainsbury's and get uh, all the same produce, the fresh baked goods, all the stuff in the big store, um, minus some of the household stuff, but simple cleaning stuff is there. And, and the line moves through it really fast. Uh, they're obviously making money on it. I don't think anybody's subsidizing them, but even if it took a subsidy, um, it would be interesting to see if, if Stop and Shop or, or Big Y particularly, which is a regional corporation may have a stake in being public spirited, would operate um, a walkable location in Central Amherst. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if Sainsbury was making money on it, but who knows, maybe the situation is different there. Yeah. But public service, a public spirited operation. Yeah. Wonderful organization. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I had, um, there are a lot of places that could use something like that. I don't know, is Chris still on? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, have you guys, Heard of anything like that or you know business subsidies anything like that i haven't people have talked about it um i think you know we would have to um probably figure out how town council might feel about doing something like that um you know every time you consider something um where the town is spending money um you have to figure out well okay we're going to spend more money here so what do we not spend so much money on. So it's a kind of balancing act, but it's certainly a conversation that we could have. I've also thought, you know, if, if you are looking for areas with new, for new housing developments, could you incorporate, you know, commercials, a little bit of commercial space for like a mom and pop type market or a small, small grocery store? Um, I guess it would depend on the zoning for that area, but um, something to consider. Okay. Again, I think it would be necessary to figure out some way of subsidizing it. There's quite a bit of commercial space downtown in Amherst that's not occupied. And I only imagine that it's because the rents are too high. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how do you make those places affordable to a mom and pop store. So that, that's a question that I would have. Thank you. There was a little food store in downtown Amherst, you know, in the in the row of shops 
that are near what used to be Louis Foods, but which, you know, I, for, I don't know what the name of that row of shops is, but between the CVS and the St. Bridget's, and it went out of business. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what all the issues were, but anytime I went in there, the produce was pretty clearly old, that they weren't getting enough customers. It's hard to park. And they, you know, they tried and went out of business. And there certainly are people in Amherst trying to get a food co-op going in Amherst. And they keep talking about downtown, but I'm sure they face all the same difficulties. Yeah. You know, it's not easy when you can't park near the store. You have to have enough customers to go there. I don't, I'd be curious, somebody could maybe do a survey as to where people in Clark House and Ann Whalen and Chestnut Court get their food now. Yeah. You know, the people who do live downtown mm -hmm. might give us some information. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, um, so we're a little past four, um, just in terms of next steps. Uh, there is um, the next forum. I'm just gonna share the screen here. Um, the next forum is on social participation and inclusion, communication and technology and civic engagement. And we're planning to have that on June 27th, also at 2.30. Um, and our plan was to have it at the Bang Center. Stay tuned. Um, you know, we'll talk to talk about the hybrid option. Um, if that's if that's what we want to do it might not be able to be at the bang center so um we'll keep information posted on engage amherst on the age-friendly community um facebook or um website uh on engage amherst is that right maureen i <laughs> just want to make sure uh, it's um, on the project page of the on engage amherst yeah okay um so uh, let your friends know about these forums. Um, the next one will be on transportation in July and then health and community services and public safety um, in August. Um, and then a Spanish speaking forum in September. Um, and then once we have all this, all the feedback from folks and um, from all the public forums, we will be developing a um, community assessment and action plan um, which we can submit to AARP and Dementia Friendly Massachusetts. Um, and the action plan will name, you know, different organizations um, in the community that, that could implement these, um, the recommendations. Um, and then the town may also want to consider appointing a committee or having an ad hoc committee to sort of oversee this, um, this work going forward. So I appreciate you all for coming. Um, any last minute thoughts or questions? Okay, well, seeing none, we'll, um, we'll post the slides on Engage Amherst and we will have a recording, um, except for the small section that I missed, <laughs> um, but I did take notes. So we'll also have the notes available um, and we'll incorporate those into the action plan. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye, Becky. Bye, bye. 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 bye.